Okay, welcome, good morning. Um, so what we have seen uh, in the last couple of lectures were uh, already the first algorithms to do some, uh, let's say, model checking with regard to omega regular properties or regular safety properties. And so far, we have uh, always specified uh, LT properties as uh, being a set of traces. There's a set of infinite traces. And this is, uh, for practical purposes, uh, rather cumbersome. Um, so typically, we are looking for more succinct so more compact representations of these kind of properties because we were always saying something like E is the set of properties, something like uh, A0, A1, etc. in 2 to the power AP omega, such that, for instance, for all i, we have that AI satisfies a certain logical formula, which was a kind of invariant. Um, and sometimes these formulations are much more uh, let's say, uh, incomprehensive. So what we're going to do in the next, uh, well, actually today is uh, we're going to introduce a logic, linear temporal logic, to describe these kind of properties. Okay? So what we will have is a LTL, which stands for linear, linear time temporal logic. Um, this logic has been defined by uh, Amir Pnueli. At least he introduced it into computer science in the end of the 70s. Um, and the idea is that this logic is uh, used to describe LT properties. Okay, so it's just another syntax, if you want, to describe uh, LT properties, and we're going to see that uh, actually the semantics of a formula uh, will be an LT property. So that will be made very concrete that every syntactical object in the logic immediately corresponds to, an, uh, to a, such a property. So let's start. So um, what's the syntax of this uh, linear temporal logic? Um, so linear temporal logic uh, contains uh, ordinary Boolean uh, logic like uh, statements like true. We have atomic propositions, conjunctions and negations, like, just like uh, first order logic. And then uh, we have uh, two new ingredients. Uh, this stands for next. So intuitively this means in the next state phi holds. And this stands for until, this means phi 1 holds until at some position phi 2 holds. We will be much more concrete about what the exact uh, semantics will be. And then, um, so here are some examples. So the interpretation of this logic is given over infinite traces. Um, so for instance, the atomic proposition A holds for an infinite trace if and only if the first position satisfies A. In my uh, example, it's colored blue. Um, next, an infinite trace satisfies next A if and only if the next position satisfies A. And finally, until, blue until green, is satisfied by an infinite trace if we have a finite segment of being blue and this segment is being ended by something which is green. Okay, so A holds until B holds. Good. Then uh, we have derived uh, operators as usual. So we have uh, things like, uh, I mean, disjunction as being the negation of a conjunction and so forth, implication as being the normal uh, implication. Um, but we also have uh, derivatives using this until operator. So if we say true until phi, well, true is a statement that holds for every state. So this means that true must hold, there is a finite segment satisfying true until we satisfy phi. This simply means at some point in the future, phi should hold. Yeah. And because that's used very regularly, uh, we have an abbreviation and this is uh, diamond phi. So some people 
in the original paper by, uh, by Pnueli, actually, he, uh, he wrote that uh, diamond uh, phi, he wrote it as F phi. F stands for future. Mm -hmm. That's another notation that you every now and then see in the literature. Um, so eventually phi is the following, right? By A until B, we were forced to have a finite segment being blue until we reach a green state. Now, because every state satisfies true, we can have some finite segment. And then at some point we have to reach a state satisfying B. And then there is a box phi. So box phi stands for not eventually not phi. Yeah. So first, eventually not phi means eventually you reach a state that does not satisfy not phi. Yeah. Now if you put a negation in front, it means it's not the case that eventually you reach a position that satisfies not phi. Now if it's not the case that eventually you reach a situation where not phi holds, it means that always phi holds, right? Double negation. And because that's also a very frequent operator, we uh, introduce this syntactic notation. It stands for box, uh, box phi, and that stands for always phi. So here is an example. An infinite sequence, an infinite trace, satisfies always phi if every position along that sequence satisfies the formula. Uh, well, A in this sense. And in Pnumedi's case, he uh, wrote this as uh, box phi. He wrote this as G phi. And G in his thing stands for globally. Good. So here is a, an example of a formula which is a nested formula. So it's box always the case that if you try to send, then in the next position delivered holds. Okay. So this means in particular if you have a sub part of an uh, infinite trace, then if you have a position that is uh, satisfying try to send, this atomic proposition, then the next position should satisfy delivered. Because of the, uh, of the box in front, it means that um, it holds for every position, right? So uh, if, you have, if you would have this formula, try, I just abbreviated, next delivered, right? So this holds for an infinite trace that satisfies try initially, and then in the next position it has delivered. Yeah, but then at some point later it could have some other try which has a next position which does not satisfy delivered. This is definitely possible. Yeah. So the difference being that if we put a box in front, it means that in this sequence, at every position where try holds, right? So not just the initial position. So for instance, uh, it holds here, then it holds that their delivered holds. But in particular also here, if their try holds, then this also should satisfy delivered. So this trace does not satisfy this formula, yeah. but this one satisfies the formula. Yeah. I hope you see the difference between putting this, uh, this box in front. Um, so here is uh, another example. This says it's always the case. So again, along every position in the infinite sequence, it holds that if you try, then try must hold until the message is delivered. Okay, so next was really pushing something saying about the next position. Now you only know that at some point in the future the message will be delivered, and until it will be delivered, try to send must hold. So here, for instance, this is the first position, along at, at, at least in this fragment, where try holds, then somewhere in the future delivered holds, and that it means that the whole segment until delivered becomes true, needs to satisfy try. Good. And then uh, you can uh, replace this try to send over here as being true. Uh, so then we get this diamond. 
true until delivered. So this holds, for instance, in this following sense. As any position try that we have along the sequence, at any position that satisfies try, it should be the case that at some point in the future delivered holds. So at some point in the future, in this case, three positions later, delivered holds. And this must hold for every try position. Now, in particular, this also satisfies, is also satisfied by the following thing. So eventually, try box eventually delivered. Uh, suppose that I have here, I have a try. Uh, here I have something else. Here I have a try. Here I have something else. Here I have a try. And here I have something like delivered. Yeah. Then um, this try satisfies the uh, property because tr this try is followed at some point by some delivered. This try is also followed by some delivered in the future, namely the same one. That's also fine. Yeah. And this one is also satisfying the formula because it's uh, saying if try eventually, which means now in the next position, delivered holds. So you see that this position that satisfies delivered ensures that those three tries are basically satisfying try eventually delivered. Yeah. So it's not saying that every try will, match, will be matched by exactly one position that is delivered. That's not what it's saying. Okay, good. So uh, examples in mutual exclusion. Uh, we want to establish that um, it's never the case that two processes are in the critical section at the same time. So it must always hold that either critical, that process one is not in the critical section or process two is not in the critical section. Now, if you remember what was the LT property to specify this property, this was a, a much longer sentence to say this is the set of LT properties such that blah, blah, blah holds. Um, here it's much more uh, succinct. It's always the case if a train is near, then the gate is closed. Um, it's always the case if I do a request, then at some point in the future I will be responded to this request. And uh, things like this, uh, it's always the case that either the traffic light is yellow or the next position is not red. This is also an example that we have seen in some uh, previous uh, examples. Okay, um, now you can also nest these formulas. So for instance, if I have box eventually phi, this means always eventually phi. Okay, so think about about an infinite sequence. So here is my infinite sequence, right? And now what holds the following is always the case at any position. So for instance here, but also there, also there, also there, at any position it must hold that eventually in the future phi holds. So that means for instance uh, and for this position, it could be the case that this phi holds, right? Now you also have to satisfy this position, because you have to satisfy all, right? So for instance, for this one, it could be the case, well, maybe this one satisfies phi. Hmm? Now this one is satisfied by this phi, but now we have to satisfy this one. So now it means at some point in the future, phi must hold. So you can imagine, there are infinitely many crosses. Actually, every position has a cross, so there are infinitely many positions that need to satisfy phi. So this intuitively means infinitely often. Um, so that means that we can write things down like fairness, what we have seen before. So uh, if you would to say, like to say something like unconditional fairness, something must happen infinitely often. For instance, infinitely often process I must be in the critical section. Then we just write it down like this formula. Strong fairness was saying if you infinitely often something is enabled, then you should be able to take something infinitely often. If your infinitely often process i is waiting to enter the critical section, then infinitely often it will enter the critical section or being in the critical section. Um, you can also nest the other way around, eventually always. So what does that mean? So this was 
So now you have eventually always phi. So again, I have my infinite sequence. And now it says the following, eventually. So that means from some point on in this sequence. Let's suppose it's here. Yeah? From this point on, always phi holds. What does that mean? It means that this position satisfies phi, but always phi must hold from this position. So that one also should satisfy phi. This one must satisfy phi. That one must satisfy phi. Actually, all of them, this one satisfies phi, that one, exactly. So the whole thing here satisfies box phi. Yeah. But because of the, um, of the prefix, this uh, eventually, it means that from some point on. So it might be the case that here phi holds. Maybe at some position it doesn't, and maybe here again. That's all fine. So it might be in a prefix where every now and then phi holds. Yeah. Maybe zero times. But from some point on, it must always hold. And this is something that we have seen in the previous lecture. This was called a persistence property. Good. Why is this helpful? We can, for instance, now specify weak fairness. What was weak fairness saying? If from some point on, continuously something is enabled, if from some point on, continuously, always, you are waiting to enter the critical section, then infinitely often you will enter the critical section. And that's the right-hand side. So here you see in one slide the three fairness conditions that we have seen uh, when we discussed uh, fairness a couple of lectures ago. Good. So now this was syntax. Now we get to the real semantics. And we have to lay this down in a mathematical sense. So what are we going to do? We're going to provide a mapping. We're going to interpret, interpret formulas over traces. That's what I did all the time. This was an infinite trace, and I was arguing whether the property holds or not on that infinite trace. So how are we going to do this? So we're going to define a relation, and this is a binary relation, between an LT formula and a, between an infinite word. So an infinite word, which is the fo of the form A0, A1, A2, where every of those A's is, as before, a set of atomic propositions. And the idea is that the formulas are written down over the set of atomic propositions AP, and the infinite words have as every position a set of atomic propositions from AP. Good. So I take such an tr infinite trace, and now we're going to define the semantics by means of structural induction over the syntax of the formulas. So for every formula, we're going to fix whether this infinite trace satisfies the formula or not. So this works as follows. We start with the most simple formula, which is true. True is satisfied by every trace. So that's easy. So in particular, we write sigma satisfies true. Now, maybe you are a little bit, uh, if you're not familiar to this, then uh, this is actually an infix notation. In fact, what it should hold, what it should write down is sigma comma true is a pair, which is a member of this relation. Yeah. Now, this is not the way we typically write things down. We typically write down an infix notation. So this is written as infix notation. And instead of writing down this, we write down sigma satisfies true. And this is something that you are hopefully familiar with from the lectures of Malo. Yeah. Good. But in fact, what we, this is what we really define. Yeah, I, I mentioned before, this is a relation relating infinite traces to formulas, and we write it down in this infix notation. Good, what's the next? The next says that sigma satisfies A, so we have this infinite trace satisfies the atomic proposition A, if and only if at the initial position of sigma, what's the initial position? Well, this is A0. This A0 must satisfy A. What does that mean? Well, A0 is a set, so this is nothing else than writing down that this small a must be a member of this set. Good. Then we have a conjunction. Conjunction is simple. It's set to have to satisfy both conjuncts. 
So sigma needs to satisfy phi 1 and sigma needs to satisfy phi 2. Then we have negation. So sigma satisfies not phi if and only if it doesn't satisfy phi. That all looks very straightforward. So now let's go to next. Next we have to reason about the next position. Now we cannot just pick the next position because the semantics is defined as a pair, as a relation between a sequence and a formula. So here we have a sequence sigma and we have the formula next phi. And now we want to say that, yeah, basically from the next state on in sigma, phi must hold. How are we going to do this? Well, the idea is um, that we're going to strip off the first element a0 and we're going to take the suffix of sigma starting from the next position, which is a1. So in my notation, we take the suffix of sigma starting from position 1. And this is position 0, this is position 1. And that means I'm just looking at a1, a2, a3, and that must satisfy phi. Okay, so this, the logical, let's say, formula next is basically, if you want, pushed in the semantics by stripping off the first element and going to the next symbol here, and then you have to satisfy phi. Good, then we have uh, finally uh, until. And until is as follows. So we have phi 1 until phi 2. So what are we going to do? We're going to split basically the sequence into two parts. I hope this is intuitively <laughs> clear. I need some, some space. I need to split the, uh, the trace into two parts because I first have to detect at, from which position or, um, at, at which position does phi 2 hold. So that's uh, in this formulation position j. In a diagram this becomes immediately clear, I hope. Yeah, so here is sigma. Sigma is uh, a0, a1, etc. And now we say pick a position. So we take some position a, j. And I'm just uh, postulating at, at that position phi 2 holds. So this position satisfies phi 2. What does that mean? It means that the sequence starting from here, so the infinite trace starting from this position, so a, j, a, j plus 1, a, j plus 2, etc. This whole infinite thing, right, this satisfies phi 2. So this is exactly what is the first conjunct in the semantics. So it says, okay, take the suffix from sigma, this is sigma, starting from position j, this position, and then look at the infinite trace starting from this position. So this is the whole thing which is here. Now, this needs to satisfy phi 2. What's the next thing that we need to uh, fulfill? Well, all the previous positions, right, need to fulfill phi 1. So intuitively speaking, this needs to satisfy phi 1, that needs to satisfy phi, phi 1, that needs to satisfy phi 1, all positions up to a, j minus 1, that also needs to satisfy phi 1, because then we have phi 1 until phi 2. So how are we going to specify that this thing specifies all phi 1, we're going to look at all the suffixes of all these positions. Yeah, so for instance, we're going to look at a2, a3, etc., and the whole thing, including aj, aj plus 1, etc. This whole thing needs to satisfy phi 2, because I want to express that this position satisfies phi 2. The same I have to do for a3, a4, etc. The same I have to do for a5, etc. So what I'm saying is, for all j, or for all i, up to, but not including j, so because I go up to including j minus 1, I need to require that the infinite trace starting from position i satisfies phi 1. Good. Any questions? Okay, so
So um, I mentioned, I started my lecture by saying, okay, this is just another syntax to write down LT properties. So what is the LT property that the formula specifies? Well, this we define as being the words of phi. So I take an LT property, and this is going to define what are the set of LT properties defined by this LTL formula. Well, this is simply the set of infinite traces over 2 to the power a p omega that satisfy the formula. Okay, so all the sequences, all the infinite traces that satisfy the formula, this is the set of LT properties um, that is actually, or the, the LT property specified by the formula phi. So this makes it explicit that the logic is nothing else than syntax on writing down LT properties. Good. Okay, now you can use this semantics to derive uh, basically the semantics of eventually and box. So recall the semantics of until phi 1, until phi 2. This was saying, okay, there is some position j from which on phi, I mean, where phi 2 holds, and for all the other positions, ai for i up to j, phi 1 holds. Now let's just stick in eventually. What was eventually? Well, eventually phi, right, was defined as being true until phi. Now, if you plug this in in this slide over here, then it means that this last conjunct is trivially satisfied because this phi 1 is simply true and every sequence satisfies true. So we can just drop it. So indeed, eventually phi means there exists a j such that from that position on phi holds. And there is no requirement on the prefixes up to j because of true. Similarly, you have box. What was box? Well, box phi, right, was saying not eventually not phi. And um, that's not difficult to see that uh, now you get that, uh, so if you have a not eventually not phi, that means a negation of this term where here is a not phi, and then the double negation can be pulled out and then you get a universal quantification over all j that satisfies phi. Yeah. So box really means globally or always because you say for every position phi holds. Good. Um, so this was the semantics over one, basically a trace. Does a trace satisfy a formula? Now, because we're interested in model checking, I'm also interested in whether a transition system satisfies a formula or not. So we're going to assume that T has no terminal states, and that means that all the traces of T are infinite. It does not have any, basically, finite uh, traces. So how can we find this over a transition system? So we're given a transition system and an LT formula, and now we're going to say, okay, the interpretation is over infinite path fragments, so a path satisfies an LTL formula if and only if its trace satisfies this formula. I mean, this was the relation I just defined by induction. This was defined over infinite traces, sigmas, and formulas, phi. Now I lift this, so to speak, to infinite paths and phi. Strictly speaking, you should use a different relation here, different notation, because it's a different relation. It's common to not do this and use the same notation all over the place, but it's good to keep in mind that this is a slightly different relation because this relates paths to formulas, whereas this relation relates traces to formulas. Good. Um, and that means that a trace is uh, actually uh, in the set of traces that is specified by, uh, by phi. So how do we get uh, to this LTL semantics over paths. So here is a, an example of a transition system. The set of atomic proposition is AB. Here we have a state only satisfying A. This is neither satisfying A nor B. And this state satisfies AB. Notice that there are two initial states, S0 and S2. I take a path. This path starts in S0, then it moves to S1, then it moves to S2, and then it stays there by taking the self-cycle infinitely off. Good. So what's the trace of this part? The trace of this part is simply we start in this initial state S0, which corresponds to the singleton set A. Then we move to S1, which corresponds to the empty set. And then we stay in S2, which corresponds to AB omega. Claim pi satisfies A. 
I hope this is trivial to see because this trace as an initial position has A. Good. Pi, of course, does not satisfy B because B is not included in this first initial set. Se second example, pi satisfies next, not A and not B. Why is this? Well, look at this trace of pi. Then you look at the next position, which is this position. And in this position, it's the empty set. It neither contains an A nor a B. So it satisfies the formula next, next position, neither A nor B. Good. Next, next, A and B. So next, next. So we are in the first time we visit S2, A and B. And this holds because if you look at the trace, we go from the next, next, and then we both satisfy A and B. Good. Uh, not B until A and B. Okay, let's see whether this holds. In order to look at this, we have to look again at the trace. We need to find a position where A and B holds, and that needs to be preceded by a finite prefix where B does not hold. Now, this is already true when we visit S2 for the first time, because look at the singleton set A, empty set AB, and that satisfies that eventually A and B holds. And at all preceding positions, in particular here, B doesn't hold, and also here B doesn't hold. So it satisfies not B until A and B. Good. So this is the, the way of, uh, let's say, argumenting that uh, this state doesn't satisfy B, that one doesn't satisfy B, and if we move there, we satisfy A and B, and that's exactly the path we are considering. So here is a, a much more, a more nested formula, not B until box A and B. Claim, this is also satisfied by this path. How to see this? Well, we have to find a position along the sequence pi, such that from that point on, always A and B hold. Now, this is not too difficult because we, uh, if we end up in S2 and we take the self-cycle, then we end up indeed, at the first time we visit S2, this is a position where from then on, always A and B holds. So S2 satisfies this, and then we have seen that this one satis doesn't satisfy B, that one doesn't satisfy B, so we satisfy not B until we reach a position the first time or the second time or the 27th time that we visit S2 from where on always A and B holds. Good. Um, so now look at uh, this uh, part. So now we take another part. This part starts in S0 and goes to S1 but stays cycling between S0 and S1. Okay. Good, so the trace of this part is simply this alternating between the singleton set A and the empty set, and you just do this at infinitum. So does this satisfy A until B? Any suggestions? I know it's early, but... Uh Exactly. There is no B, right? I mean, you can see this here in this language, there is no B. You know? So you never reach a position where there is a B. So this is uh, not true. So what about uh, eventually B me implies A until B? Does this hold? Yes, because eventually B me uh, never holds. Eventually B doesn't hold, exactly. So, so that, that holds. Next, next, not B. Seems to be okay, right? Yeah, there's no B, so definitely also in the second position there is no B, so that seems to be okay. And the second position we are in S0 because we are in the next next, which is this position, and that means it doesn't satisfy B and so forth, right? So uh, always A definitely doesn't hold right because every now and then I visit a state that doesn't satisfy A, right? So this doesn't hold, etc. Good, I think the principle is clear, infinitely often A. Seems to be plausible, right? Infinitely often A, because uh, infinitely often I reach a state that satisfies this A. This may be alternated with, uh, this is alternated with states that have empty set, but that's, uh, that's okay. And what about eventually always A? This doesn't hold because of the empty set. Uh, so that doesn't hold. Good. I think the uh, principle is clear. Good. Um, 
So actually this is also what you can uh, derive from the semantics. So indeed you can uh, derive using the semantics of uh, eventually and box. Uh, you can just by applying standard uh, derivations derive that an infinite trace satisfies box eventually phi if and only if there are infinitely many j's such that the suffix starting from position j satisfies phi. And similarly we get that an infinite trace satisfies eventually box phi if and only if for almost all j, uh, we have that aj satisfies phi. And that means that almost all means there are finitely many j's for which it doesn't hold. And this is another way of phrasing that from some point, point on, you always must satisfy phi. Good. Um, so now we can say that the state in a transition system, so that was the notion we just have seen, a part satisfies an LTL formula if and only if its tray satisfies the formula. Now you can lift this to states, again uh, abusing the same notation, yeah, although again this is a different relation because we relate states with formulas. So when it does a state satisfy a formula, the intuition if all possible parts starting from that state satisfy that formula. So that means for all pi starting in S, the trace of pi satisfies the formula. And that means that basically this S is, uh, we say that S satisfies the words of, uh, of phi. Good. What is the interpretation now of a transition system? Now we say a transition system satisfies a formula if and only if all its initial states satisfy this formula. So a transition system T satisfies an LTL formula phi if and only if for all its initial states, the initial state satisfies the formula. Now what does it mean for a state to satisfy the formula? That means that for all parts starting in that state, and that means if you have the quantification over all initial states, we, we're just saying that for all parts in the transition system, those parts satisfy the formula. There is no part violating the formula. That's basically what it's saying. And that means that uh, the traces of t are included in the words of phi. Ah, this, this should ring a bell at you, because we have seen this before, because we defined the semantics of an LT property P, and there we defined that a transition system satisfies P if and only if the traces of t, uh, t were included in P. So now I get exactly the same thing because this formula is nothing else than syntactic sugar to describe p. So now in rather than phi we write this as, uh, uh, rather than pi, a p, we have phi and then we say the transition system satisfies phi if and only if, yeah, you cannot write down this, the traces of t are included in the formula, but the formula describes a set of traces, so instead of phi we get here the words of phi. Mm -hmm. So actually P is the, the words of phi. And here we get the words of phi, yeah, of phi. Good. So this is exactly the relation we have seen already before. Yeah. So uh, this really means that the transition system satisfies an LTL formula phi if and only if all the infinite traces of the transition system are included in the infinite traces that are described by the formula phi. Good. Same example as before. Statement, the transition system satisfies A. So when does this hold? It means that all parts starting from some initial state in my transition system need to satisfy A. There are two initial states, as I mentioned before, this one and that one, but because both of them are labeled with A, every trace starts with an A. So the transition system satisfies A. Good. What about the transition system says from some point on always A? Now this is satisfied if I start in S2, because then the only thing I can do is stay there, and that satisfies from some point on always A. 
namely from the initial position on, always A. But if I start here, there is also a possibility to just cycle between S0 and S1, and as we have seen already, that does not satisfy eventually always A. So this is not satisfied, because there is one part, in this case taking this cycle infinitely often, that does not satisfy this property. Eventually always B, or infinitely often neither A, I mean not A and not B. Good, so again we have to consider all possible traces. There is a trace starting here, taking the cycle infinitely often. This satisfies already from some point on always B, because there is this B here. So that seems to be fine. Now consider the behavior that I go here, I take this cycle finitely many times, and then I move to S2. Well then, same argument, eventually I reach S2, and then always B holds. So that satisfies the first disjunct. Last run that we have to consider is you take this cycle infinitely often. Okay? Taking this cycle infinitely often will definitely not satisfy the first disjunct, so we have now to consider the second disjunct. Is it the case that infinitely often we have neither A and not B? This is the case because S1 is labeled with the empty set. That's neither A nor B. We visit this state infinitely often because we take this cycle infinitely often. So also that part satisfies the formula because it satisfies this second disjunct. Okay? Good. Uh, there are more examples, but I think you get the, the, get the idea. I'm going to skip this. So for each part, of course, you either satisfy the formula or you don't. So that's definitely the case. For every state, this also holds. Uh, you would tempted to say, but this is not the case, right? Because why is this not the case? Um, for a state, S satisfies phi means for all parts starting in S, you have to satisfy phi, right? This means... For all parts starting in S, you do not satisfy phi. What about mixtures? What about if a certain part satisfies phi starting from S, and another part starting from S doesn't? And that's exactly the situation here. So from S, um, there is a part that eventually reaches A. There is a part that does not eventually reach A. So it does not satisfy the formula eventually A but it also doesn't satisfy the formula not eventually A because there is a possibility to go to A. Yeah. So we see one part satisfies the formula eventually A, the other one doesn't. And if you look at not eventually A, this part says satisfies not eventually A and that one doesn't. So it's exactly the, the mirrored version of it. So don't draw the conclusion and that this uh, is the case, and that the same holds for uh, actually transition systems. Um, one slide to argue that you can write down properties now in a very uh, simple way. So consider the following uh, LT property. I think this was a property that we used for, uh, for some traffic light before. So suppose I want to specify the set of all infinite words such that for every position, if A, this small a, is in the set AI, then either it must not be the first position, it not the initial one, A0, and B must at the previous position. Okay, so this is basically saying if you see an A, it must be preceded by a B. Yeah? And it also means it is not allowed to occur at the initial position 0, and that means that I must be strictly larger than 0. Good. So another way of writing this down is for all positions, uh, if B, B is at position J or A is not at position J plus 1. So this is the LTL formula. This is exactly the set of infinite words described by the formula. It's always the case that B holds or next not A. This is B. Holds at position AJ. So that's B. Or, this or. A is not in the next position J plus 1, which means next, not A. This must hold for all positions, and this for all positions refers to this box here in front. 
So this formula, box B or next not A, specifies the first two lines of my slide. Um, the set of all words of the form, the following. Uh, you have Bs, but uh, uh, some non-negative times. Then you have an A, then you have again a couple of Bs, then you have an A, then you have a couple of Bs, then you have an A, etc. Um, this is something like the following formula. You have a B and not A. This B and not A refers to this singleton set A here written in red. Okay. Now you say until I reach an A and not B. This A and not B refers to the singleton set A. Okay. Now the next thing you see is that every A needs to be preceded by zero or more times a B. Every A needs to be preceded, uh, I read it backwards until, by a B. This must hold for all positions. So therefore I have a box here. So this formula describes exactly all words of this form. Good. So I hope after this slide uh, you agree with me that the logic is a kind of, uh, yeah, succinct as a compact way of writing down these kind of properties. Good. The next thing I like to discuss is uh, equivalence of formulas. So when are two formulas equivalent? I'm going to say that phi1 is equivalent to phi2. So equivalent means not syntactically the same, it means they denote the same set of infinite traces. And that means if and only if the set of infinite traces described by phi1 equals the set of infinite traces described by phi2. So in terms of transition systems, it means that phi1 is equivalent to phi2 if and only if for every transition system you can think of, finite, countably infinite, it doesn't matter, for all of them it holds if t satisfies phi1 if and only if t doesn't, I mean satisfies phi2. Okay, so if phi1 holds, phi2 must hold, if phi1 doesn't hold, phi2 should not hold. Okay. Now you know many of those equivalences. For instance, um, you know that uh, this junction is, uh, you can just mirror it. So this is symmetric, so you can just say it's phi 2 or phi 1. Yeah. This is an obvious case. Yeah. Uh, the same for double negations, not not phi is equivalent to phi. Yeah. Good. The most interesting cases are the ones in which the operators next until box and diamond occur, and those are the ones that we're going to consider. So one property that, um, that we're going to see holds is uh, it's not the case that next phi holds. So it's not the case that at the next position phi holds is equivalent to saying that at the next position phi doesn't hold. Sounds reasonable. Yeah? Uh, this equivalence goes in both directions, right? So this is equivalent to that and vice versa. Think about this. So how are we going to show this? So what do we need to prove? We need to prove that this formula is equivalent to that formula. By definition, this means that the words of the left formula are identical to the set of traces or the words described by the right formula, phi2. Good. So how can you prove this? By using this semantics. Yeah, because that's what, how these words of phi1 are defined. So we start with next, the left-hand side. So I take the left-hand side and I'm saying, okay, take an infinite sequence, suppose it satisfies this formula. Now what do I want to prove? I want to prove that this sequence also satisfies the right-hand formula. So what does that mean? It means by means of the semantics, first I have to get rid of the first negation. Now, this sequence does, I mean, satisfies not this formula if it doesn't satisfy the formula. Semantics by, of negation. Now I'm going to use the semantics of next. So what does it mean? A0, etc. Sat doesn't satisfy next phi if and only if A1, etc. doesn't satisfy phi. Yeah? This next was equivalent to stripping off the first symbol here in the sequence. Okay, now I start reasoning basically towards this formula. So what does that mean? It means that 
This, of course, does, I mean, satisfies not phi, first negation. But that means that A0, etc., satisfies next not phi. And these are only if and only ifs, and therefore the two formulas are equivalent. So this is the way in which you can prove that these two formulas are actually denoting the same thing. Eventually phi or psi is equivalent to eventually phi or eventually psi. What's your feeling? Is this true or is this, doesn't, is this not true? Any suggestions? There are only two possible answers, right? So the question is, does disjunction distribute over diamond? Now, what's the easy way to see this? A way to see this intuitively is the following. Consider the semantics of diamond. What is this saying? The semantics of diamond says something of the form, yeah, a0, A1, etc. satisfies diamond phi, or if you want to abbreviate this as sigma, if and only if there exists a position I, right, such that this and this and this holds. Yeah. So read the diamond as being an existential quantification. Yeah. This is the diamond, here is my existential quantification. Does this junction distribute over existential quantification? Of course it does. Yeah. So, conclusion, it also distributes over diamond. Yeah. This is correct. What about this? Um, eventually phi n psi is equivalent to eventually phi n eventually psi. Same mental game. Look at the semantics of eventually. Eventually says something with existential quantification. Does conjunction distribute over existential quantification? No, all alarm bells in your head should start screaming now, this is nonsense. Yeah. So this indeed is not the case. Yeah, that is of course an intuitive argument. In order to see a counterexample, this is a counterexample. You see a transition system with a green and a blue state. This satisfies eventually B and eventually A. Let's check this. Eventually B it satisfies because the initial state already satisfies B. Now there is also a trace, namely you go from B to A and you satisfy eventually A. Yeah. So the trace that starts here, goes there, goes back, satisfies eventually B and it also satisfies eventually A. Agree? Yeah. But it doesn't satisfy eventually B and A. Why not? Yeah, there is not a state that is green and blue at the same time. Yeah. So, um, conjunction doesn't uh, distribute over um, diamond. Similarly, you can have the following, and why is this similarly? Well, remember that box phi is nothing else than not eventually not phi. Yeah, so box is nothing else than syntactic sugar of something with eventually with a double negation. Yeah. Um, so to see this, the first line says conjunction distributes over box. Why is this? Well, we have that sigma satisfies box phi if and only if for all positions something holds. And here is your for all and here is the box. We know standard logic conjunction distributes over universal quantification, so it also distributes over box. Disjunction does not distribute over universal quantification, and therefore you cannot pull this out, so you, this is not equivalent to uh, box phi or box psi. Home exercise, find a counterexample why this is not the case. 
Good. The most important equivalents, and these will become very important later on in also the model checking algorithms, uh, both for LTL and also later for other logics, are what they call expansion laws. So we have seen laws for next. We have seen some laws, I mean, at least distribution over conjunction and dis uh, disjunction of um, diamond and, uh, and box. And now I would like to make statements about, uh, about untils. So this is the, the uh, equivalence which holds, as we're going to see. So for the until, the following holds. Phi until psi. Okay? Let me remember what was this phi until psi. So we have that um, sigma, which is uh, A0, A1, etc., satisfies phi1 until phi2, if and only if. Yeah, there is some position, let's call it J, such that from that position on, the sequence satisfies phi2, right? And we had, for all i strictly less than J, that ai, ai plus 1, etc., satisfies phi1. Now, that was what we mentioned, uh, what we had as semantics. Good. Okay, what does this expansion law tell you? And first read it from left to right. We need to satisfy phi until psi. So let's write it down as that way. So phi until psi. So this becomes a psi and that one becomes a phi. Good. It says this is equivalent to psi holds now. What does that mean? Psi holds now. It means g j equals zero. That's all allowed. If j equals zero, then this second conjunct is trivially fulfilled because it's a universal quantification over an empty domain. So this, then the formula holds. Agree? So psi is enough. If psi holds now, then phi until psi holds as well. So that's the first disjunct here on the right hand side. If, however, this is not the case, suppose that this doesn't hold, then we can exclude the fact that j equals zero. But that means that j needs to be one. What does that mean? It means that at least the current position zero needs to satisfy phi. Yeah. So that's what this says, phi. And from the next position on, because, yeah, for zero this doesn't hold, but then for, we have to find a j which is strictly larger than zero, so that means from the next position on, we have to try to find a position where phi until psi holds itself. Yeah. So another way of uh, seeing this, that uh, this is my sequence. And I want to know that uh, phi until psi holds. Now there are two possibilities. Either psi holds here, then we're done. Or if this is not the case, suppose this is not the case, so psi is not true here, what should be fulfilled then? Then we know that psi doesn't hold here, so psi must hold from some point on in the future, from here. And but then here phi must hold, because we have phi until psi holds. If psi holds somewhere here on the right, this state or this position definitely needs to satisfy phi. So then we have phi, right? But in addition, we need to make sure that from here, we still need to fulfill phi until psi. So we say and next phi until psi. Yeah. Good. It's called expansion because I expand, so to speak, the until formula uh, by this case. Now, what's the strange thing about this formula? The strange thing about this formula is that there is a formula on the left-hand side and exactly the same formula occurs on the right-hand side. Yeah? Which is a bit strange. Yeah? Normally, uh, normally you try to simplify formulas uh, or you expand it, but it's a bit weird that you get a formula on the left-hand side which is equivalent to the right-hand side. So we go into a little bit more detail of this because what, that's a kind of a special case. Good. You can simplify this a bit. If phi is true, 
I hope you can see this. Yeah, if phi is true, so this means true until psi, then we have eventually psi. Then this again is psi or this phi becomes true so that we can drop and then immediately we get next and then we get the same formula but the same formula now is eventually psi. So this is just a simplified version of the first line. The most important thing is the first Good, because eventually psi is true until psi. True until psi is, plug this in into the first line, psi or true and next true until psi. Good, this can be simplified because this is just eventually psi, true until psi, and then we can drop the true and then you get immediately this thing. Good. This should not be too much surprising because eventually it's just syntactic sugar for something which is in terms of until. So if I have a law that holds for until, it definitely also holds for the special case um, diamond. Good, the same for, uh, for box. And uh, that's uh, hopefully intuitively easy to understand. Always phi holds if and only if phi holds at the current position and from the next position on, always phi holds. Psi. And this goes in both directions, right? So if psi holds now and from the next position always psi holds, then we can conclude that always psi holds. Good. This is the way to see this. Always psi is equivalent or defined as being not eventually not phi. Now you apply the expansion law for eventually. You apply this to this eventually not psi. So plug this in into the second line. So that means this becomes not psi or eventually, I mean, sorry, next, eventually not psi. Good. And this first negation is over here. Yeah. Good. Now it's a matter of just pushing in this negation. This becomes a conjunction and this negation is distributed over the two conjuncts. So this is the situation you have. We have that not not psi is equal to psi. And um, this is basically here. And uh, now the duality of next, be careful what happens, this not next something, we have seen you can push the negation inside by the next. So that is what happens here. So we get next not something. And now you see not eventually not psi, which is again box of psi. And that's what you exactly get box of psi. So the two last lines over here are just special cases of the first line. That's what this slide basically at the end tells you. Good. So the expansion laws are what they call fixed point equations. Who has never heard about what is a fixed point? That means you all know what is a fixed point? Yeah? Are you cheating me or is this really the case? So just tell me, what's a fixed point? From anywhere you can conclude to this point. From anywhere you can conclude to this point. Uh, this is to me a bit, uh, a bit imprecise. Uh, so I give you a function. Let's call this function f, okay? This could be any function, x squared plus x, uh, sinus x, I don't care. What is the f exactly? Let's give us such an f. What is a fixed point of f, mathematically speaking? Uh, formula always holds. Uh, Well, mathematically speaking, uh, you say that x is a fixed point of function f, right? Uh, whenever f of x equals x. No? That's what is called a fixed point. So now you can plug in, plug in your favorite x, 
right? So uh, I don't know what, I mean uh, x square. So you take f of x is x square, and you try to check that, for instance, 0 is a fixed point, because f of 0 equals 0. Yeah? Uh, 1 is a fixed point as well, yeah? but 2 is not. Yeah? Good. So this has fixed points, for instance, x equals 0 and x equals 1 are fixed points. Yeah? Or fixed points. Good. What are the fixed points of fx equals x? Uh, all, possible values. all possible values. So infinitely many x's, right? If let's say I didn't specify this, but let's suppose that f is defined on the reals, then uh, we have actually uncountably many fixed points. Okay? Good. So here we have if f is something of the form uh, from reals to reals, then uh, we have uncountably many fixed points. Good. Now look at uh, the formula which is on the top. It's again, it's a kind of a function, yeah, because you can consider this as a function that takes as input a formula, right, and gives on the right hand side a formula, yeah. And uh, so you can talk about uh, basically the fixed points of such a formula. So I try to make this explicit. So here are the, the sub-formulas. And again, don't look at the last two cases because they are just special cases of the first line. As we already identified, this formula on the left-hand side occurs syntactically also on the right-hand side. And um, this does not yield a complete characterization because there might be several formulas that satisfy this equation. There are several x's satisfying this equation. There are several x's satisfying this equation. Yeah? So there might be several formulas satisfying this equation. So for instance, if, uh, if you take psi to be equal to a, then the formula false, which is something of the form uh, a and next fo uh, false, if you plug this into, into, into the yellow formula, you see that the formula false satisfies this equation. Yeah. Substitute false for the yellow part. Yeah. And you see it satisfies this formula. But if you take box A, so plug in box A, is equivalent to A because phi, psi is A, and next box A. So that's another formula. Yeah. And not just syntactically another formula, it's semantically another formula. Ah. But that's a bit troublesome, right? Because we have an equation satisfied by two formulas, and obviously those two formulas are not equivalent. Yeah? I gave you a fixed point, the yellow one, thing, and apparently, uh, in my case it's not an equality, but it's an equivalence, but there are several x's, there are several formulas being different. x equals 0 and x equals 1 are different but they're mapped onto itself. Yeah, they are equivalent to itself. So this equation is not enough because there are many formulas. In this example, I gave you two, but I'm pretty sure you can now construct more uh, that satisfy this, uh, this the, the last uh, formula. So we have to be much more precise. Good, so we know that box A, of course, is uh, semantically different from false. So what are we going to do? We're going to show, and that's what I'm going to show, uh, I hope, in a minute, that actually the until formula is what we call the least fixed point. Now what's a least fixed point? The least fixed point means it's a fixed point, but it's the smallest one, the smallest one with respect to a specific ordering. So in, for instance, in my example uh, A, right, then the smallest one is, if I only take the is zero. Yeah? So the least fixed point is here zero. This is the least one, the smallest one. If I take as ordering just the ordering on the real numbers, yeah? the total ordering on the real numbers. Similarly here, well let's be a little bit more precise if I take this for instance as being the non-negative reals, still there are uncountably many fixed points. What is the least fixed point? 
the least fixed point for a function on this domain yeah, is again zero. One is also a fixed point, the square root of two is also a fixed point, but it's not the least fixed point. Yeah? So what we are going to see is that the until can be characterized by this equation. Remember the argument, there are many formulas that satisfy this equation. So which formula is exactly the until formula? It's the smallest formula. Smallest in which sense? Well, a formula, what does it do? A formula set spe specifies a set of traces. So what does smallest mean for a formula? It's the smallest set of traces. Yeah. Why is it a trace? Because a trace was an LT property. So a formula is nothing else than an LT property. An LT property was a set of traces. So smallest in my sense is going to mean the smallest in terms of a set. Yeah. What's the ordering on set? Subset inclusion. Good. And actually, eventually is also a least fixed point. Why is this also a least fixed point? It's simply true until something. So it's a just a special case. Why does it turn by box into a large greatest fixed point? Because it's the negated version of an eventually formula. Yeah, so the way to keep this in mind is a negation of a least, well it's not of course mathematically a bit nonsense, but the negation of a something which is smallest becomes something which is potentially largest, which happens with the box. Okay, I'm going to show you this for the, uh, for the first case. So uh, the expansion, the LTL formula, uh, phi until psi, is the least solution, the smallest possible solution of the equation a formula is equivalent to psi or phi and next this formula. Good. So uh, the way you're going to do to phrase is the following. So I'm going to show you the following. So the claim is the following. Uh, rather than taking the formulas, I'm going to argue about the infinite traces. So I'm going to say the words of phi until psi. Yeah. Remember this is exactly the LT property, yeah? so this is exactly the LT property of the formula phi until psi yeah? is the smallest LT property P which is a subset of 2 to the power AP omega, such that words of psi disjunction, or I mean union, A0, A1 in words of phi, such that a1, A2, etc. belongs to P. This is a subset of P. Moreover, words of phi until psi equals Let me first explain uh, what is written down in the last line. My claim is this is nothing else than the expansion law, and maybe I go back to the slide where the expansion law is made uh, explicit. And this is, I hope, readable. If you look at the first uh, top line, right, and read this as uh, phi until psi, yeah, equals psi right hand side or yeah, phi holds now, which means the current A0, etc. satisfies phi, and 
next, which means A1, yeah, satisfies phi until psi. Yeah, so uh, I hope you see that this means, uh, basically this means yeah, psi or open bracket. This says phi holds now. Yeah, now because I look at A0, all the A0s which belong to the words of phi, which means phi holds now. And, yeah, and this says next. How do I see the next? Because this starts from A1, right? I'm considering here words that start from A0, such that starting from the next position A1, you satisfy phi until psi. Phi until psi. And here is the expansion law, yeah? because this is also, of course, phi until psi. So what I wrote down is just in a set theoretical sense, exactly the expansion law, but now in terms of sets rather than in terms of formulas. It's exactly the same thing. And what is furthermore important, it's the least fixed point, and that is right down here, it's the smallest property, smallest in sense of subset, right? In the sense of subset inclusion. Yeah, I can give you more than one LT property satisfying the thing, but I'm looking for the smallest one with respect to this, satisfying the condition here in the middle, and maybe we make this purple, this is this condition here. And this has psi or phi and next property. This must be included into the property itself. Good. So I hope you see the connection between the least fixed point is now the smallest set. Yeah. And the equation, uh, the expansion law is now rather than writing it down in logics, I write it down in terms of a set theoretical sense because that makes life in our setting a little bit easier. So what does smallest mean? Yeah. So, smallest LT property satisfying this uh, purple condition. What does that mean? It means the following. Means, let's be more precise, one, P being words phi until psi satisfies this purple condition. B, it's the smallest one satisfying this thing, so words phi until psi subset of P for all LT properties P satisfying this purple condition. Yeah. So condition one says words phi until psi satisfies the condition we're looking for. The second condition says it's the smallest one because for every LT property satisfying this purple condition, it holds that words of phi until psi is a subset of this. So it's the smallest one with respect to the subset inclusion. Good. So how are we going to show this? Good. So the first condition follows directly from the expansion law.
namely the expansion law that uh, phi until psi, etc. In fact, Uh, in this purple condition, uh, you can even replace, can be replaced by equality. The subset inclusion, which is completely at the end there, is actually an inclusion. Because if you look at there, this is just written down the expansion law, right? It's psi until phi and next phi until psi. So the first thing is easy. Now the second condition. That's a little bit harder. So now we have to show that it's the smallest one. Um, so how are we going to do this? So let P be an LT property satisfying the purple condition. Um, we show that words phi until psi are included in P, because that's exactly what we need for the second condition, right? This thing. Okay, first we analyze what it means for P. So since P fulfills this purple condition, we have a couple of things that we can conclude from that. First, the words of psi are included in P. Second, if B0, B1, etc. belongs to words of phi, and if I also in addition know that B1 B2 belongs to P, then B1, B2, etc. Uh, sorry, B0, B1, etc. belongs to P. Yeah, that is basically follows directly from this uh, purple condition uh, that uh, uh, if this word B0 belongs to phi, that's the second part of the disjunction. Right, and I have a B1, B2 belonging to P, that's over there, that is included in P, so that means that B0, etc., must also be in P. Notice that this is important, this B0. Good, now I say let A0, A1, etc., satisfy the formula phi until psi. Then, what would we know? By the semantics, we know that uh, there exists some k such that ai, ai plus 1 belong to the words of phi, phi, for all i strictly less than k, and for starting from position k, we know that psi holds. Good. So this follows directly from the semantics of LTL. Good. What do we need to show? To show, just to repeat, we want to show that this words that we're just considering, so this A0, A1, etc., belongs to P. Yeah, because we want to show that the words are included in P. And now we do a backwards induction. 
So I start with 4. So I start by saying AK, AK plus 1, etc., belongs to the words of psi. Good. Then this implies that AK, AK plus 1, etc., belongs to P. Why do I need, want this? Because I will know that words, well, this is thanks to uh, condition I. Yeah? Condition I says that words of psi are included in P. So now we can conclude this it belongs to P. So now we can use condition I that actually AK minus 1, AK, etc., belongs to the words of phi. Phi and AK, AK plus 1, etc., belongs to P. And this follows from condition I, I, I for I equals K minus 1. Good. Now I can use the following, that actually from this it follows that AK minus 1, AK, etc., belongs to P, and this follows from 2, or 2 times I. Then it follows that AK minus 1, uh, AK minus 2, AK minus 1, etc., belongs to the words of phi, and AK minus 1, AK, etc., belongs to P, and this follows by, I think, for I is K minus 2. And now I hope you see the pattern. Because uh, now you see that here we have seen that AK, etc., is in P. Now you get AK minus 1, etc., belongs to P. Yeah, so I go backwards. And I can follow this until K reaches 0. Yeah, and that's what I need. So repeat this argument. Again, each iteration using those two arguments. And finally, I get that A0, A1, A2, etc., belongs to P. And that's what I needed to show uh, because we have here that A0, A1 belongs to the words of phi until psi. And our proof obligation was indeed to show that A0, A1 belongs to P. Yeah? So that's what I do by this backwards argument, I get finally my conclusion that A0 belongs to P, and therefore the words of phi until psi is included in P. Bottom line, the most important equivalence in LTL is the expansion law. There are several formulas satisfying the expansion law. The until formula is the smallest one. Yeah, that's the bottom line. Thanks for your attendance. Next lecture uh, takes place Friday morning.